Hello, everyone. My name is Howard Gilman. I'm the chancellor here at the University of California, Irvine, and I want to welcome you to this special forum. As the only world-class research university in our region, we have a special obligation to mobilize our distinctive expertise to serve the public during this difficult time. And we have adopted a whole university response. Our frontline doctors, nurses, and clinical care staff are providing nation-leading clinical care to our friends and neighbors who have taken ill and are exploring innovative treatments that will improve people's chances. Our public health experts are advising on how best to protect our community. Our scientists are researching the basic dynamics of the virus as a step toward improved clinical outcomes, the development of vaccines, and expanded testing capacity. Every corner of the campus is making a contribution because universities such as ours were built to serve society when society is most in need of clinical expertise, scientific breakthroughs, expert discussion, and reliable information. You can visit the campus's website at uci.edu to learn more about our efforts. This forum discussion among leaders of our academic health enterprise will provide an overview of the current healthcare situation in Orange County and a look at how its ramifications are transforming how we will receive healthcare in the foreseeable future. Thank you so much for joining us today and thanks to everyone who organized this event. Please be well. Thank you, Chancellor Gilman, for your leadership that has been so vital to our university and Orange County as we navigate this pandemic together. As you know, at UCI, we are deeply committed to improving the health and well being of the people of Orange County, the state, and far beyond. This is a time when our mission marquee to discover, to teach, to heal is so obviously powerful in addressing society's needs for health. As the only academic health system in the region, UCI has been at the forefront of the community's response to COVID-19. And I am so proud of our brave and talented healthcare workers. And that includes everyone, the staff and the medical professionals. It is not an exaggeration to call them heroes. Now, as an academic healthcare system, we have been able to call upon resources and talents across the entire university, as well as the broader University of California system. And this connectivity has proven so very valuable. At the front lines of care, we learn from each patient, and then we teach others far beyond our walls. Our unique ability to turn insights into action has real life implications, and in many cases is the difference between life and death. Within days, UCI had clinical trials of drugs and other research underway. New tests were rolled out, vaccines were under development, new designs and production of PPE and emergency use ventilators. Immediately, UCI experts in population and public health, infectious disease, epidemiology, integrative health, all of these began to work together with local officials, community partners, and the state to design best practices based on the latest data, treatments, and resources. And our rapid understanding of the virus and what comes next has been the result. It is therefore my distinct honor to introduce you to my esteemed colleagues who are leading the charge and are with us today. Professor Bernadette Bodnabala is the founding dean of our School of Population and Public Health. She's been providing community leaders with essential real-time assistance on measures to reduce transmission as she continues to train future professionals by safely engaging them at the frontiers. Chad Left Harris is the CEO of UCI Health the leader of our hospital system. You will hear how he was preparing for a pandemic even before there was COVID-19. How he was implementing, how he has implemented strategies to care for our patients while keeping our healthcare heroes safe. 
lessons that will change healthcare in the future. Dr. Michael Stamos, the Dean of our School of Medicine, has been guiding our physicians and students through the rigors of the pandemic while launching scores of research efforts to confront the disease. Dr. Susan Wong, our Medical Director of Epidemiology and Infection Prevention, has been at the helm of our infection control measures to prevent the spread of infections and to protect patients and staff, as well as the community. Dr. Shaista Malik, Associate Vice Chancellor and Executive Director of the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute, has been employing integrative health to maintain the physical and emotional health of our workers and patients. And Dr. Andrew Neumer, Associate Professor of Public Health, who has been tracking the national spread of COVID-19 and will offer us insights on trends and what we can expect to the for the future in Orange County. So with that, I wanna open up this panel and I want to give the first question to Dean Bowden Alvala. So, Bernadette, this has been an amazing period of time since December. And so rapidly, we've done so many things. At this point in the pandemic, what public health strategies have been most helpful in containing COVID 19 and in Orange County? Thanks so much, Steve, for the question. And I'd really just like to begin by saying how proud I am of all of the residents of Orange County. Um, my colleagues from all around the country say, wow, you're the model for what's supposed to happen uh, and how, how communities are supposed to respond. So what did we do? We began by relearning how to wash our hands properly for 20 seconds, lathering up with a lot of soap. We learned that maybe we shouldn't be shaking hands. We learned that maybe we needed to be about six feet away from other people. And finally, when we were in a really, really crit critical place, we were looking like we were going to emerge uh, somewhere like Italy or like New York, we, we, we made some real commitments as a community and we stopped going out, we sheltered in place, we, we have done very, very diff we've made very difficult decisions, but that shifted that line, flattened it, if you will. So instead of a doubling of, a vi of the COVID virus every three days, we ended up with about, what now, 60 or so cases every day. And so we did a huge, wonderful thing because we did it as a community and we did it with our partners and all of our partners, but the Orange County Healthcare Agency as well. So I just applaud everybody. Those were all really significant things um, that, we, that we need to continue to do in one way or another to try to keep the virus under control. Thank you. So, so let, me, let me ask Andrew, you were quoted in the New York Times last week. And you said, it's hard to expect models to offer precise forecasts at this point. In, in fact, you were quoted as saying, it's like trying to repair a car while it's still running. <laughs> Can you expand on this? Thank you for ha the question. Thank you for having me on this forum and thank you for your leadership during this time. Models are tricky because they don't predict the future as, as well as we, we might hope. I mean, models, are models. There are some equations in a computer. They are not the same as data. What we have in the United States is a patchwork of many different epidemics. And together, this patchwork of epidemics makes the COVID-19 epidemic in the United States, which is part of the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide. There's a lot of moving parts, and it will play out you know, differently in Orange County than it will in Topeka. And you know, we have to be prepared to react to changes as they occur. The, the, the positive changes that we've seen in Orange County, for example, that my, my Dean uh, Bernadette bowden albala mentioned a moment ago, those were not predicted by our models uh, where we were really apprehensive about the, what the, the near-term future 
was going to look like in Orange County. And I mean, it's because of curve bending that we have done better. And I think we're all glad we're doing better. But the point is that the models can be overly pessimistic. The models can sometimes be overly optimistic. We have to constantly update them. And they are a tool in the armory, but they are not the only thing that should guide our response. So, so if, if we've got that level of, of knowledge, but uncertainty, because there's so many variables, uh, uh, Chad, I, I want to turn to you. People are clearly wondering how you prepare a, a healthcare system with so many unknowns. So you've evolved it in the face of the challenge. Um, what should the community know about what you've done and what should they know about the resources we've made available um, and, and how you've managed? Thank you, uh, Steve. Thanks so much for the question. It's my pleasure to be here. And I, I have to just start by thanking all of our caregivers first. Uh, this has been an unprecedented time and they are running to the fight uh, at every moment of the day, and I couldn't be more proud of all the work that they're all doing. So that's about 6,200 if you think about all faculty, residents, um, every frontline care worker from the nurse to the uh, environmental services, a person who's cleaning, uh, disinfecting the rooms to everybody in between. So, um, so I'll tell you a few things about what we've been doing uh, to get ahead of this curve that Bernadette just mentioned is that luckily, as an academic medical center, or, the, or I like to say the university teaching hospital component of UCI, we started planning for this long ago. We were actually built for this as the academic center. Uh, I like to say that because experts like we have on this call have been very involved in tracking and monitoring this before we really even knew it was coronavirus. And even before that, we plan and we drill for surge and capacity um, uh, things all the time, whether that's a, an unknown event that might happen, let's say at the Honda Center uh, or, or a pandemic type event like this. We plan for things like this. So we've been using this as a guide as we go through this and really we boil it down to a very simple principle that the Academic Medical Center needs to lead the way and be the source of truth and then that we stop at nothing to band together and make sure that we're meeting the complex healthcare needs of the most vulnerable around us. And a few things we've done is we've planned out additional surge spaces and beds. We've all, over 200 additional beds were envisioned if we needed to surge. We set up our incident command structure very, very early on in January before others were even talking about it. We've started in-house testing, both for molecular testing as well as antibody testing, very popular topic right now, within our laboratory in, in days, not months or weeks, like we uh, initially had heard and thought. As I've already mentioned, we participate in clinical trials at the bedside, extremely important. We continue to do that. One thing that you may not know is that we suspended all of our elective and non-urgent visits and surgery schedules early on so that we could empty out the hospital to be prepared for the surge uh, and make sure we preserved and conserved our scarce resources of protective equipment. So that was about six weeks ago that we actually started to turn that volume off very quickly. It took us about two days to shut that down and empty things out. Uh, we're also convening a regional call amongst all OC hospital leaders and their incident command structure every Friday just to make sure that we're all in lockstep and planning appropriately. So those are just a few things that we certainly are constantly communicating to our coworkers, to our physicians. Um, and one of my favorites is that we started providing a coworker commissary for groceries. Because you know what, the last thing you wanna do after working a 12 plus hour shift is go to the grocery store and the, the, at one of the early days, the, the shelves were bare, right? So uh, we provided that at no cost to our coworkers and loaded them up with wonderful uh, stacks of groceries to go home. One less thing for them to worry about. So we're really focusing on the safety and really just our total team to make sure that uh, they are well cared for. Thank you, Chad. Bernadette, I wanna come back to you for a moment. Um, uh, Chad talked about the critical need to um, um, uh, make beds available in the hospital to prepare for COVID patients. Um, and what that has meant is that things that were scheduled were put on hold. Um, but just because they were scheduled uh, didn't mean they were not critically important. And perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about the data that Americans seem to be 
um, stepping back from needed medical attention. And I'm wondering what you could advise. Yeah, uh, thanks again, Steve, for, uh, for a really important question. You know, as COVID has unveiled itself, it has unveiled itself as a very odd virus, right? So we have respiratory infections and people requiring ventilators, but it's, it's unveiled itself as targeting people who have other medical problems, who have hypertension, who have diabetes, who are obese, um, who have asthma. Um, and I think that this just, th this sort of begs the question of why aren't those people um, you know, why aren't they being taken care of just because of their conditions? Um, and so I think, I think to your question, we need to be thinking, everybody needs to be thinking about taking good care of themselves now during COVID and going forward. Forward And so people who, um, from a public health perspective, if you have a medical condition and it needs to be taken care of, now is the time to take care of it. Um, we don't know, it may be a year from now that researchers will find out that people who took care of those conditions, who kept their hypertension lower, who went to the surgery and had you know, some type of uh, stenting for cardiac or, or, or took care of other medical procedures, that they were really the most resilient and that they were able to handle COVID. We know, and I know, I don't know if you're gonna ask me this or not, so I'll be very quick on this. We now we're seeing strokes and in my area of research in you know, sort of alarming, you know, in alarming rates in younger people. We're not sure exactly why we're seeing that, but everything we are seeing points to the fact that this is the time more than ever that people need to take care of themselves. They need to watch what they eat. They need to do their physical activity. And if they had a procedure or need to have a procedure or need to go to the doctor, now is the time to do it. You don't, don't you. want to be in a weakened state. Thank you. Um, Susan, maybe you can talk to us a bit about how healthcare practices have adapted for safety in the hospital and, and, and maybe, and outside the hospital, and, 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 and perhaps what makes a medical center, a, an academic medical center like UCI, unique in dealing with challenges uh, like COVID-19? Thank you. Yeah, there's a number of things that we had to change. I'll start with the patient care. Um, absolutely had to move to telehealth, um, had a real platform that was actually already in preparation to move that we could actually leverage to um, be able to connect with patients in a fairly efficient way. We had to change um, the way that we screened. In the beginning, it was where did you travel? Um, now it's very much what um, cadre of symptoms do you have that might suggest that you have COVID so that we would rapidly get you into a private room, um, rapidly care for you, and ultimately de determine whether or not um, you should go home and really didn't need a, a simple checkup. Um, we also started to do drive-through testing, figured out the very most efficient way to keep people distance, to get their tests very rapidly, um, and to be able to move them through seamlessly in multiple different places around um, the UCI health arena. Um, and in addition to the way that we care for patients, we also needed to care for those that actually came into the hospital, so not just the outpatients, but we started um, entry screening, um, so not just to the um, the visitors in the beginning, of course, now there's very, very limited visitors to, um, to very limited um, needs. So, for example, parents of um, babies in the neonatal ICU can still come, um, but there are otherwise very, very strong restrictions. But the employees come in and they get screened, they get a temperature check, they get a symptom check, and they get a badge um, linker that suggests that they've been screened. They're coming in now, of course, with universal masking. And then we had dedicated COVID units. We um, specifically had um, long-standing plans um, for how we would react to a pandemic. And then, of course, when we sensed that coronavirus was likely to come to the United States, had plans for an ICU dedicated unit, a non ICU dedicated unit, and um, trained up specific teams to be able to be used to the type of care that would be needed and the type of personal protective equipment. And um, we actually doubled cleaning throughout the hospital, all clinical areas, twice the amount of environmental cleaning. And in our dedicated areas, we actually have 
one person who actually does common areas because we know that coworkers were congregating even with a mask, even with um, trying to, to distance. We have to do patient care. We have to touch things. Um, we have to make sure that we can um, eat at, at a distance apart. So a number of things have gone into play. And the last thing that I'll mention in terms of what makes a, a medical center, an academic medical center, so distinctly unusual, it's not just um, the prowess of the people within the university and in the School of Medicine that are not only um, physicians, but they're often researchers, they're often um, linked to academic societies and um, presidents and on the boards or linked to um, CDC uh, in getting usual information that way. Um, but they're also tied to outside of the School of Medicine. So one perfect example is the way that we generated face shields. Um, we had a need, we linked to the School of Engineering, um, we linked to the Innovation Center. We had a number of extraordinary volunteers who were just coming up asking what they could do, and we are now printing, 3D printing of thousands of face shields um, to meet the needs of, of the internal um, enterprise for both inpatient and outpatient care. It's really been a remarkable um, adventure and will continue to evolve. We're very nimble, and these types of things make us really able to, to be an example and to meet the needs. Well, thank you. That that leads me so naturally to talk to to Michael. Um, the the amazing momentum of basic translational um, uh, and clinical research that has been happening across the university. You've been central to that, and maybe you can just share a bit of an image of of what's going on and how how quickly that came to the fore and how you helped do that. Thanks, Steve, uh, really appreciate it. I do wanna echo the comments made by others about the amazing sense of teamwork and collegiality, which has always been in my mind, our secret sauce here at UCI, but it really has come to the forefront and it's really incredible to see. Um, immediately following the designation of the COVID-19 outbreak as a pandemic, we quickly pivoted and assembled the UCI Joint Research Fund, really led by the Office of Research on Main Campus, Promote Karganikar, School of Medicine, and multiple other schools within our campus, including population of public health, nursing, pharmaceutical sciences, biological sciences, physical sciences, engineering, uh, to name a few. And we, we really assembled a, a, a sizable amount of money, and then we were fortunate enough to have one of our great donors who, who likes to remain anonymous but has agreed to let us mention his name uh, with the hope that it will encourage others to donate, John Two, And John Two matched what we had raised and we ended up with a $2.5 million fund to fund COVID related research that will have an impact on this pandemic. And I'm pleased to say that we've had over 50 submissions for funding. We've already approved 15 of those submissions for funding, and we are continuing to um, receive additional funding requests. Many of these projects will have significant impact within the next three to six months. Some are a little farther out, like vaccine production, but will undoubtedly have an impact, not just locally, but globally. And that really is uh, an incredible uh, asset that we, that we have to offer. One of the... Um... Uh, approaches that uh, we've heard about is the use of convalescent serum. Can you maybe comment on that and and uh, explain it a little bit? Sure. So, um, first of all, we are uh, putting together a biorepository, and that biorepository will allow us to collect samples, which largely include serum, but also include um, other body uh, fluids from COVID patients who consent to that. And in addition, we can collect serum from COVID patients who have convalesced or healed. That is, they are more than 14 days out from their acute illness. And antibodies in those patients' serum can be tested and evaluated in terms of how robust their antibody response has been. And then those can be used to treat actively infected patients and hopefully ameliorate or reduce the severity of infection in those patients. And we indeed have an active biorepository program and we have an active convalescent serum program. We are part of a larger consortium of, of uh, convalescent serum program, which is really a, a national program at this point. Thank you. I, I think I heard the statistic and it's now obviously out of date, 
that have crossed the 10 campuses of the University of California, we had over 350 active immediate investigations going on at the clinical and translational level in response to COVID alone. And UCI is leading the way in many of those. Uh, Shaista, that brings me to, to, to thoughts about integrative health, and, and it, it touches on many different issues. Um, one, of course, is why is integrative health particularly important during a pandemic, um, and, and how are we moving ahead with integrative health to help during a pandemic? So thank you for that question, Steve. Uh, paying attention to whole health is more important now than ever before. Uh, the type of stress that we as a society uh, are facing during this pandemic is really unprecedented. And paying attention to whole health, meaning both emotional well-being and physical health, means uh, you know paying attention to the basics like nutrition, exercise, sleep, but also the mind-body connection. And they really not only create the foundation of health, but they help with being resilient against what we're going through. Uh, we've started at UCI Samuel A. Institute a well-being initiative that's in conjunction with our colleagues at the Medical Center with the School of Medicine and UCI HR for our staff and providers that addresses strategies for dealing with this unprecedented stress. Uh, we've opened up free virtual services to the Orange County community. And over the last few weeks, we've been offering over 65 hours per week of virtual one-on-one -on -one or small group classes. And this includes Zoom sessions for mindfulness, guided biofeedback, guided acupressure techniques, guided yoga, and tips for better sleep and nutrition. And the response has been overwhelming. Uh, we've had in the last two weeks over uh, 450 people participate and recommend the service to others. Stupendous. Um, as I think about how we care for each other in the hospital system, outside the hospital system, um, I come back to, to Chad for a moment. Um, what is the place that, of UCI Health in helping the Orange County community? Um, and how important is, is the, the give and take between a hospital system and the community at a time like this? Well, thank you. I think as, as the only university teaching hospital or academic medical center in the community, I think, as we mentioned, I, I like to say that we were, we were made for this. So I think one of, one of the things that we do every day is taking the expertise of those on this uh, uh, town hall and many, many others and pushing that out community-wide uh, and doing that in a very coordinated way is something that uh, we see as our role. Uh, I also think that Dr. Stamos just mentioned uh, about participating, as did you, about trials. And that's something where I, I see that as really never ending as we go through this because as Dr. Wong and others know, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of continue to go through this over the next year, 24 months or longer before a vaccine is available. So these trials are gonna be extremely informative and helpful as we do that. We see that as our role within the medical center. Uh, to enhance the overall health of our community. Um, and again, going back to providing in-house testing, not only for our own caregivers and patients, um, but you may not know that we're doing that for many other institutions around Orange County and beyond uh, because we're able to stand that up so quickly. So those are just a few examples, Steve, but uh, happy to stand for other questions as well. All right, so it seems like to me that we are dealing with this in Orange County very effectively, very proactively. There's been some matter of, of luck in that we are not, um, uh, we weren't uh, caught unawares uh, and therefore we've maintained good control. Um, but now let's, let's look a little bit forward to what's coming next, because I think everybody's beginning to think about what does it mean to reopen? What does it mean to move forward? And, and, and uh, maybe it, it, you all have such different and powerful views on this. Let me start with Andrew. Um, 
you, some have predicted that there'll be more cases in the fall. Um, and maybe they will overlap with influenza uh, in occurrence and make it a double challenge. Um, tell us what your thinking is about the second and potentially other waves of COVID. Thank you. We're moving from the phase where we're bending the curve to the phase of trade-offs. Uh, we cannot lock down for 15 months straight. Populations won't do it. It's impossible. So we're starting to ease lockdowns and starting to do more social interaction than we were in the last six weeks. And with that comes trade-offs. So there will be more cases um, and there will be a wave in the fall. I, I virtually guarantee it. The only thing that would prevent a wave in the fall would be if there's sustained transmission all summer long. But the way to think about this epidemic is in terms of the final size. You know, we're, it's not gonna go away until herd immunity is achieved. So that can be through a vaccine or it can be through people surviving natural infection. And you know, it's gonna take 50% or more of the population to, to, to have some sort of immunity before we'll, we'll achieve that threshold. So uh, we're, we're pretty far from that now. And in the, in the fall conditions will be more um, conducive to spreading as, as we see with other respiratory viruses. We'll have K through 12 presumably restarting and we'll have uh, temperature and humidity in, in a sort of sweet spot and outdoor UV uh, diminished compared to the summertime. And uh, there, there will be a fall wave. Uh, it's, it's, it's virtually certain. Okay. And so it's something we have to use our time now uh, to steal for that and to prepare for it. Michael, um, um, when you're thinking about the fall, among the things you have to consider are the training of our future physician workforce. Um, how is this impacting your thinking about uh, medical education? Well, we've had to we've had to adapt a little bit. Of course, in the short term, we had uh, an additional consideration of of our supply of personal protective equipment or PPE, and we also have to consider the safety of our entire workforce, which includes our medical students, residents, and fellows, as well as our faculty, of course. And so, we have tried to limit uh, the exposure of any caregiver to a known or suspected COVID patient, and we now are reintroducing our students into the healthcare providing environment. We, we took them out for about uh, a one month to one and a half month period because of the aforementioned concerns. And now we are reintroducing them as of this week. We will purposely try to not have them interact with known or suspected COVID patients. As Chad already mentioned, those patients are isolated in a couple of wards. And so that makes it a little bit easier to do so. Um, but, but they are part of our healthcare workforce now and in the future. So what we are providing to them is actually a very unique and important aspect of healthcare. This will not be the last pandemic in their lifetime. It's not the first pandemic in my lifetime. And so we can expect more and that this is a really important part of, of their learning. And luckily, most of them have youth on their side and therefore are not in the higher risk or vulnerable categories. Excellent, thank you. Bernadette, let me ask you the same question. Your, your public health students must be um, remarkably engaged in at, at this time when it is so clear that their work um, is relevant to all of us. What, what's been going on with your, with your school? Uh, well, um, a lot, a lot actually. So, um, just like the hospital, back in January, um, we really focused as a school on the things that we could do here for UCI and um, how we could get the community of the academic community and the the larger Orange County community prepared. And so we went on this whole, we had student ambassadors, about 70, 80 student ambassadors, teaching people again to remain vigilant with hand washing, 
what social distancing meant, if they were going to wear a mask, how to wear that mask. This has evolved now, and we're working with the hospital um, on creating some you know, more enhanced information um, chat lines, so that's something that we're doing. Um, the students are also involved in a lot of research that we're doing, and, and um, to Andrew's point about, um, you know, what kind of steps we need to take, and how, if, we, if we all were to get out there, what is that gonna do to, to the curve? Um, our students are involved in helping to support research that we're doing with Orange County Healthcare Agency um, to try to do things like make predictions. So what, you know, what has more impact, going to a restaurant and eating outside or everybody going, being allowed to go to Costco at the same time. Um, so these kind of, you know, I'm using those examples as models that we're really trying to do and trying very much to anticipate what's going to happen here in Orange County and how public health can really um, be part of that. That's great. You know, that, that makes me think, Shaista, if, um, you know, we know that in response to this pandemic, um, telemedicine, telehealth has moved ahead much more rapidly than it might have otherwise because people favor the face-to-face -face interaction, whether they're patients or, or providers. How is telemedicine impacting integrative health? Um, so thank you for that question. You know, we uh, were very prepared for uh, rolling out telehealth because of our institution's efforts and investment in creating the platform. Uh, like you said, face-to-face -face and doing video visits are so much more impactful uh, for when you're trying to teach someone how to, uh, you know, do meditation or mindfulness. Uh, we've even been pioneers uh, in the integrative health world on taking touch-based modalities like acupuncture and teaching our patients guided acupressure techniques. And, you know, interestingly, that's been one of the biggest uh, surprises for us is uh, how many patients are wanting that kind of guided uh, teaching through these video telehealth visits. Does it work? Uh, you know, that's a great question. And that's what's great about being in a, a academic institution. So we've put in for a research study looking at the effectiveness of techniques like uh, guided yoga and guided acupressure, and we will be tracking outcomes to see if it works. Uh, but at least anecdotally, you know, patients seem to love it. They keep booking appointments to do it. Excellent, excellent. Dr. Wong, um, I'm gonna give you a really open-ended question. Um, what are the biggest unknowns as we look forward? So there are several big unknowns. Maybe the first one is um, how seasonal is this coronavirus? There are seasonal viruses that are in the coronavirus family and we just don't know it will this be um, very seasonal, mildly seasonal, and it will impact um, what type of surge that we could see either over the summer as things start to open up and certainly in the fall as the weather changes and the temperature and the humidity drops. I think the second thing that we um, have a big unknown about is whether or not and how um, school will reopen in the fall. I think there's a lot of active modeling, um, like Dr. Neumer and others who are actively thinking about this. The very younger age groups, they don't know how to do hand hygiene. They don't know how to um, socially distance. And, and more importantly, um, grandparents are a very, very large workforce for after school child care. And so that will juxtapose um, children who tend to be much more um, minimally symptomatic, sometimes even asymptomatic with um, the highest risk group that we're trying to protect. I think another big unknown is how people behave. You know, we are thinking about putting people back into work, allowing them to self-monitor, to self-distance, to try to um, do um, telecommunication if they can, and um, to really try to remind when you should wear a mask and when you should try to be, be distance. It's going to be a real learning experience about what Orange County tends to do. Multi-generational households, do people tend to protect the elderly, um, those with high risk? Do they do that even in the home when they're coming in and out with other social engagements? 
Um, and finally, I'll say that um, we have a lot of unknowns around nursing homes. We've got a real effort at UCI to partner with public health to actually train and teach um, some of the most vulnerable areas, and we'll continue to do so, and we're going to see how much um, these types of activities can really mitigate a major pandemic. So individual behavior is going to be something that we have to think about and monitor. Um, that, that transcends all of the different domains you're expert in. Chad, I'm gonna ask you that type of question about a hospital. What are hospitals learned and what are the need to prepare for in the next wave? Great question. I think the first thing we've learned across the country is flexibility matters for large organizations and being able to turn on a dime with the latest information that comes out uh, is extremely important uh, when you're dealing with so many un unknowns. I think uh, every medical center or every uh, health system an organization out there has got to be refining and refining and refining their institutional-wide pandemic planning efforts, right? As we mentioned from the start, we plan for this, but you can only tabletop and drill it so much until you're in it, and then new realities and new questions hit. So continue planning is so important. I think listening to our experts that have gone before us around the globe, locally, nationally, Dr. Wong and her teammates are constantly providing us information from other colleagues, not only around the University of California uh, uh, medical centers and others, but around the globe. And I think making sure that we're not deaf uh, to that information and make sure we're bringing in that outside information. And again, being flexible and adjusting on the fly, I think is gonna be so important. Diversifying our supply lines is the other big one. We've talked about mm. inventories of protective equipment, and, and even who knows, the unknown about other uh, drugs and other things that we may not be able to get if another surge and another surge and another surge continues. So start now and diversify your supply lines to make sure that you're in the best uh, case you can be from all of your inventory. So, so Andrew, I'm gonna ask you another impossible question. When is the right time for Orange County to ease physical distancing measures? Well, I mean, we have to understand it's, it's not a marathon, it's a 26.2 mile sprint. So if we wanna keep the uh, curve bent, it, it's gonna take constant vigilance. I mean, the curve is not some piece of rebar that you can bend and it maintains its shape. It's, it's more of an elastic material that can snap back. People are not gonna, um, I mean, if, if our only goal is to reduce the number of new cases, then the 15 months, I would say, of straight, of straight lockdown. But that's not gonna happen. We, we all know this is not gonna happen. This is not realistic. We live in the real world, not in an ep epidemiology textbook. So we're gonna have to trade off some new infections versus being able to open the economy a little bit. And it's, a, it's gonna be really difficult to, to find that sweet spot. And that's why you said this is an impossible question. My, my advice is this, we should open up things one at a time, spaced at least 10 days apart. The serial interval of infection is five to 10 days. So it takes time before we know if doing something is changing our risk profile significantly. So, um, so we, should, we should relax one thing and wait at least 10 days and then see what happens before we relax another. Outdoor activities, uh, there was a lot of talk about opening up golf courses. You know, golf courses are probably a, a pretty safe thing to do. Uh, people play in relatively small groups. They can distance among themselves as they play. And they play outdoors where there's a lot of UV here in Southern California. And, you know, that, that is helpful. So, uh, you know, doing things like that first as opposed to reopening crowded restaurants and so on. The, the, the lockdown is gonna, the doors are gonna have to open more slowly than they were slammed shut for this to work. That, that leads me to another question. And of course, this is a moving target. And I'm gonna look to both Bernadette and Susan on, on parts of this. We've heard about testing and testing starts with if you're infected and then a testing about whether you've been uh, uh, immune. Um, we heard about contact tracing um, and um, maybe you can explain and talk a little bit about those subjects. Bernadette, you start. 
Thanks, Steve. Um, so really what I think you're referring to a little bit is well, the sort of governor's plans to open up and when we can do that and what all of that means. And so uh, I think there's a couple of things and Susan can add, right? So part of the governor's plan includes having the capability to do diagnostic testing. And, um, and so, you know, if you look at New York, tens of thousands of people were tested. Um, if you're looking here in California, the numbers uh, of those tested are less. And so one question is, if we opened up, would we have the capacity to test everybody that we needed to test, um, given that we would get an increase, you know, invariably in the number of people getting sick because anything that we do is gonna come up with more cases. And I think that everybody here has been really positive in saying that here at UCI, we've really ramped up testing and I think that's important. The other part of testing that I think everyone is hearing a lot about is surveillance, right? So how do we know how many people have had some um, exposure to the virus and have built up some form Form of immunity. Well, one other thing that I think we've, we've spoken a little bit about in that kind of question of surveillance is what does that immunity mean? And we don't fully know. And that's a problem. But I think everyone around the globe is working as fast as they can. Um, but having immunity is certainly better than not having immunity. So the surveillance study, so what will happen in the next few weeks here in Orange County is that residents are going to hear about a number of different kinds of surveillance studies. And we're, we're, we're working on uh, two that are probably important to the residents um, of Orange County. One is that we're going to go out and just look at clinics with sort of random uh, blood, getting random discarded bloods, bloods that um, just are left over from other testing, and we're going to test so we can get a sense of how many people, of, of kind of an estimate of how many people have been exposed here. Um, and then we're going to do something out in all the communities in Orange County, which again is a research program that will that will give us a sense of Orange County populations. What is what's the what's sort of the so so so. Yeah. Surveillance and, and research all sounds fine, but if I'm sitting in my living room, um, and Susan, I, maybe you want to take this, um, do I get tested every Monday morning before I go to work? Um, what, what's the future look like? What do the tests do? I, yeah, well, I think the future is bright. The capacity has um, quadrupled within a week. Uh, I do think that that will continue to expand um, because worldwide there's such a great need and the, the scientists and the companies and the innovators are working very hard to meet that need. Um, I think that the most important thing is to be able to test those who, um, who are absolutely even mildly symptomatic and even those who cannot stay. And I think that's the critical difference is if you're high risk um, and you can't verbalize, and there are many of those types of um, individuals. So for example, at UCI Health, we're going to be testing everybody who comes in the door. We have a number of people who come in from board and care, from nursing homes, and they're not able to vocalize that they have a headache or, or muscle aches. And so the high risk groups um, that really need a little bit of help to understand, and this also includes nursing homes, um, will be tested more frequently. And I think that is going to be actually essential because if they're contagious and they can't vocalize it, um, then we need to give them greater help as a community. I think the other piece about making things broadly available to individuals so that individuals can get therapy is we're going to need to rely upon the scientific evidence to bring therapeutic benefits out there. Right now, it's a supportive care um, disease. I think the other piece of it, the serology, the antibody test, the value for that and the work that Bernadette and many others, the joining of research and public health and the um, community partnerships that we have will tell us a trajectory. And I think that's actually really important and plays into what Andrew Neumer was saying is that we have to be nimble. We have to see where we are now, which we know that the immunity level right now is very, very low in California because we went into the state home order without even a surge. So now we're going to have to prep and we're going to have to do serial sampling to see how well we're getting up closer and closer to that 
50, 70 percent requirement um, for us to be able to stop a pandemic locally. So I think both of those tests are going to come up and up in, in capacity, and it's going to be up to um, experts and public health to think about how to deploy them in the most effective way. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Malik, um, early on, and uh, we heard about the fact that the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor and that that's uh, critically uh, uh, involved in the cardiovascular system. Um, and there were questions about whether sh people should keep taking their drugs for, their, for blood pressure and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about that whole aspect of, of uh, COVID-19? Sure, of course. So the ACE2 uh, receptor is a a uh, protein that sticks out of our cells uh, and binds coronaviruses, including the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it was also the binding protein for SARS-CoV-1, uh, as well as some of the other SARS uh, and coronavirus proteins. Uh, it tends, it's an X-linked um, uh, gene. And so interestingly, men have more ACE2 expression than women, and so some of these uh, changes in who's susceptible uh, and more vulnerable to a, a virulent infection could be part of, uh, could be because of these differences in ACE2. Um, hypertension, um, it turns out people who have hypertension overexpress ACE2, um, as do uh, people who are taking medications uh, that uh, upregulate some of that pathway. So uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. But it's a very tricky thing uh, because although there is a receptor uh, protein, there's also soluble ACE2, which is actually protective. And so there's this conundrum of uh, having people uh, of continue to take the medications they're on because controlling their blood pressure during this time is very, very important. Um, and so there are several efforts underway, um, including doing basic science experiments, uh, looking at ACE2 expression. It turns out that it's not only expressed in the cells of our lungs and the heart, but also the brain, which may uh, be the reason that we're seeing the kinds of strokes we're seeing. Um, it's also uh, uh, Interesting in terms of uh, epidemiology, you know, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are the number one antihypertensive drugs prescribed. Uh, so at University of Pennsylvania, they're actually randomizing patients who are admitted to the hospital and they're randomizing them to either continue their ACE or ARB medication or discontinue to see what. Um, wow. What kind of role that so plays. What's your advice to patients who aren't in a trial? take their medicine? Um, so I uh, would recommend that they speak to their physician, but you know, the more, most important thing, and this is something we all discuss as a group, is taking care of the risk factors, is making sure the blood pressure is under control and not stopping medications based on theories, uh, because currently right. this is a theoretical link. Right. All right, we have just a few minutes left, so I wanna do a quick round robin. Imagine that you're talking to a family of five, a grandparent, some parents, some children, add in a dog and a cat. What uh, would you like to tell that family? Uh, uh, let's, let's start with Bernadette. Oh. Yeah, okay, so very quickly, I would say remain vigilant about hand washing. It is probably the most important thing people can do, wash frequently and, um, and wash for 20 seconds with soap. Really try and protect um, grandma or grandpa um, because they are extremely vulnerable. And so that means in some way keeping them separate if you can from the rest of the family. Um, and again, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash and do some social distancing. Andrew. As governments ease lockdowns, you are the line of defense for yourself and your household. You need to calibrate your tolerance for risk. And age is an important factor. 
and uh, other ex conditions are an important factor. You know your health status better than anyone. You need to calibrate how much risk you are willing to take. And if, if you're not willing to take a lot of risks, then by all means, cover your mouth and nose in public. If you don't have a mask, use a bandana. Okay, Chad. Well, Bernadette took my favorite, which is wash your hands. Um, <laughs> so I, would, I would tell that to any family. Uh, I, I would also say, uh, don't prolong other healthcare needs. Make sure that you return to being as proactive as possible. And I bet Dr. Malik was gonna say this as well. Um, because left untreated, we will have a different sort of community-wide pandemic on our hands uh, and, and a larger public health problem. So I think that's very, very important. And stop for a moment and give a virtual hug or a virtual high five to any healthcare worker you see, because they deserve it. Right, Susan. I would say two things. Um, one is that it's um, sad to say, but you really do have to keep the young children away from their grandparents. I think they have very minimal symptoms when they get sick. And so um, hugs, I think that uh, verbal communication is great. I think you know all of the expressive things that we can do, but I do think we do wanna be really, really careful um, about direct contact. Um, and especially if they have a mild cold. And the other thing that I'll say is know what to do when someone does get sick. You need to know how to separate those that are ill. You need to make sure that whatever they touch is clean before somebody else touches it. And you really do need to have masks in the home in case someone gets sick and you can really um, distance those who have to take care of that person if it's a child um, or even if it's an, it's an adjacent adult. So lots of important things um, and to be vigilant about when someone looks like they might be getting sick. The virus right. load is the highest in the first week of illness. Great advice. Shaisa. So I'm going to um, agree with all the things my colleagues have stated, but I'm going to go in a little different direction. I think um, this is a really unique time uh, in that many families are home together like never before. And, uh, you know, it's uh, an opportunity and there's a silver lining in this about uh, teaching resiliency. Uh, there was some really, there was a really nice study done in New York after 9-11 uh, that looked at which kids were the most resilient a year after that horrible episode in history. And it turned out that the kids that had the, um, and they'd measured test scores, um, you know, who uh, tended to do the best were the ones uh, where the families talked together uh, about what was happening and talked about a family narrative about how do you overcome things mm. when the unexpected happens. And so that narrative of uh, sharing, you know, what grandparents have been through, uh, how they've recovered from tough times is a really important one. And as you know, we're, we're all thrown into a situation we never planned for. I think it's important as parents and grandparents to turn to our, the next generation and share with them what could uh, help them be resilient about this. Thank you. Well, D Dean Stamos had to leave to an emergency, so we'll, we'll ask him that question the next time we see him. And I would like to just thank all of you for your time, your thoughts, your incredible work on behalf of, of uh, Orange County. Um, COVID-19 has presented us with new challenges and, and, uh, and yet we've achieved so much so quickly. And I am confident that as UCI continues to provide the very best care and guides the health care of the county and pursues research, in all the ways you've described today, we will be stronger and wiser and better prepared for anything that comes next, whether it's a wave or the next pandemic. And I, I wanna end where we started um, by giving our thoughts to all of those who have been impacted directly. Um, we care about you. We know how difficult this is. It will take time to overcome this crisis, but we are in this together, UCI and Orange County, and we will emerge together stronger. So please let me remind you, the best evidence is that you need to wash your hands, not touch your face, wear masks in the right place, observe physical distancing, sneeze into your elbow, 
seek care in a timely manner. And all of what we're doing and the best advice that we have to offer is free in an online resource that we launched a few days ago, oc-covid19.org. It is updated. It is there for all of us. And we are here for you. So thank you. Stay strong and stay healthy.